Toppin Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. And for football season, we have a new schedule with Clinton Yates, no longer Fridays. He's going to join us each and every Wednesday here on the show. Clinton, uh, welcome. Welcome to Hump Day. Thank you, Mike, 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 Mike. That's the best thing about Hump Day is that commercial will always forever live on in my mind is that I just love that camel walking around the office. Everybody has a camel that walks around their office, basically. Obviously. And yeah. by the way, for me, what that spurs memories of is when I worked in Dallas and the Mavs did an incredible remake of that commercial. Really? With Dirk walking around going, it's game day. <laughs> and it is Oh, it's so good. It, you, I, I can't believe you've that. never seen it. I need to see that. I'm the, My favorite Dirk non-basketball highlight is, shut it down. Let's go home. That's all I really think about when I think about non-Dirk highlights. And, of course, him carrying plates of food made by his wife. That's what I think about. So, Yeah, so good. And, well, the thing was, like, not to get on a huge sidebar about the Mavericks video department, <laughs> but, like, they always did these great skits. And they'd have everybody in them because Dirk was like, sign me up. And if Dirk's right. doing it, like, how is anybody else going to say no? It's like, exactly. they no, had like smart. these Game of Thrones bits. They had like all this different stuff that was incredible because Dirk would be the first one to sign up and be like, yeah, I want to nice. be in the skit. Love so Dirk, uh, good times. That's, that's part good of the reason why he's awesome. Yes, one of many. That and the one-legged fadeaway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this weekend, biggest story in college football is the upset Colorado over TCU. I talked about what I thought was the most ridiculous part of everything that happened this weekend yesterday, which okay. is that everyone bothered, like, was in a in a race to get their takes off of whether or not it's okay for media to root for a team and whether they should quote unquote believe without bothering to double check the fact that Ed Werder hasn't written anything for a website or a newspaper in 25 years, and that Dion just saw a familiar face and was like, "You believe now." Dion gets the attention. Everyone's talking about his program. That's great for him. I don't mind it. I'm, this is not like a shot at Dion. To me, it's a larger uh, commentary on the reflection of uh, us as a collective media and how bad we are and how yeah. stupid aggregation is. But that's that was my media rant yesterday. Uh, there's plenty of other things to talk about with Colorado. What sticks out to you? Well, number one, to get to the point about Ed Werder, I mean, I, I do think the nature of that relationship matters quite a bit. Like, I don't think he was referring to any article. I think he was referring to his tweets in which Ed Werder referred to him as a celebrity football coach. Now, why is that something that I take within reason that Dion is upset about? Well, because Dion played in front of Ed Werder for many years. Dion is a guy who is a legit football player and also knows that Ed Werder knows that. And so while he might not be penning columns across syndicated newspapers across the country, that one word might have set Dion off enough to the point that he felt Ed was representing something that I do Fair think is a, is a legitimate beef, which is I'm still not sure I understand why people didn't think that Dion Sanders was going to be good at coaching football. There's just no world in which outside of you having a problem with the guy personally, one having a problem with the guy personally, why you would think that one of the best defensive players in the history of the game – couldn't coach a football team to the highest level is beyond me. Think of all the guys who coach, period. They're just also rands, whatever, whatever. Guys like Jalen Rose used to talk about this all the time. Player experience matters way more than the mediocrity is willing to admit when it comes to actually doing things the right way. The standing in the way part for college is all the other junk in terms of what happens with recruiting, what happens with NIL and all this other stuff. If it's just about football, I'm trusting a guy who won back-to-back -back Super Bowls and is in the NFL Hall of Fame. Like, and that's where I think Dion is taking a lot of offense to this within reason. He's like, guys, give me one good reason why I wouldn't be able to do this. He's done everything great at every level of football in his life. So you know? he, I, I disagree vehemently with your macro point, okay. but agree vehemently with your micro point. <laughs> Everything about what Dion specifically has done has suggested he'll be great at this, including the fact that he was great at this at Jackson State. Right. Like, unbelievable. Like, achieve levels not based off celebrity, but based off of how good he is at football coaching that have not been reached at HBCUs because there is an incredible lack of resources and, and all a litany of other factors that we would sure. do many other shows uh, on and that you've probably written about extensively um, for Anscape, right? I do think just because you're a great player doesn't mean you're going to be anything as a coach. No. Um, so I don't know if I'm mis am I mis no, misreading not, what you're saying. Well, here. No, what I'm saying is that just because you're a great player doesn't mean you're not going to be, doesn't mean you're going to be a great coach. But if you're Deion Sanders, 
Come on. I mean, like, Magic wasn't that good of a coach. Uh, well, again, Dion though, is a different beast than anything we've ever seen in our lives. And maybe some of your listeners aren't old enough to have watched Dion play football, like in his actual prime. The guy was a... Support- right, we're not talking about Washington Dion here. Yeah, yeah no, not remotely. And that's kind of the thing about this. I'm like, this dude was a game changer on a level that was clearly more than just freak athleticism. You know what I'm saying? This guy knew football. And I know all the stories about him falling asleep in meeting rooms and all that kind of stuff are, you know, stuff of legend. But my point is this, what Dion is doing at Colorado, and I know it's just one game. I understand that they're playing against a depleted TCU that didn't have 10 starters from their team last year. I get all that. But half the battle in living up to the hype is being able to do anything at all. If you go back and watch that broadcast and you look at the way that Joel Klatt and um, Gus Johnson were calling it, it was almost as if there was some sort of fear like this team was just going to fall flat on his face, as if they kind of weren't going to even know how to play football. And that wasn't even remotely the case. Like winning and losing is one thing, but clearly this is one of the most disciplined teams in America, like already right out of the gate. The penalties were not that many. They were executing on an offensive level. They came out of the huddle looking like a smarter football team than TCU right off the break. And so all I'm saying is for the people that are looking at Dion, it's like, oh, it's never going to work this way. Oh, it's only going to work one game. What is the purpose of hating on the possibility? What reason is there outside of simply having a problem, as he said, with a brother who walks in and does it his way? I think it's great to see. And I also think it's what college football needs desperately, especially when you got guys like Dabo running around out here with the sisters of the poor offense who can't seem to get anything done against Duke. Come on, y'all. What a weekend. Yeah, Dabo without uh, Watson or Trevor Lawrence seems to be a bit of a different guy. <laughs> Might matter a little bit. That's kind of the crazy thing about Saban over the years. It's like yeah. until like Mac Jones, he never had a first-round quarterback. Um, I might be having the chronology wrong. It might have been Jalen. It might have been – I don't remember the order of Jalen to uh, Mac, but those those three guys. So sure. that's not a shot at any of those guys. Just I don't remember the order uh, that they were in. I actually think Jalen was first. So until Jalen never had a first-round guy, um, and he still just killed it. I, I think it actually – like. This is a compliment to Dion um, and his acumen and his ability to do this. I actually think players like Dion often aren't the ones that are very good coaches because they are such great athletes. And, like, yeah. you can't possibly understand. Like, Michael Jordan would have been a terrible coach because he could push his body to the limits and do things in, that others could not physically. And he just never understood why other guys wouldn't rise to that level. And he talked about it a little bit in the last dance. And, you know, towards later in his career, he maybe started to be a little bit better at that. But... You know, for a guy like Dion, who was so incredibly gifted, we're talking about one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century, period. Like him, Bo Jackson, and whoever else you want to throw in there. Multi-sport, like broke stopwatches at the Combine. Dude was unbelievable. And yet he figures out how to get a room full of 90 guys who are no, no, with all due respect to Travis Hunter, who's incredible, Travis Hunter ain't Dion because Dion no. was Dion. Well, to yeah. get them to perform at such a high level is is remarkable. Like that, <laughs> that should be the story here. The thing is also though that shouldn't be the story because it's no, there was no reason to believe that Dion wasn't smart, and that's kind of a thing that we run into. You know what I'm saying? Like I get your yep. point. Larry Bird was kind of the same way in the NBA. People were like, "This guy's having trouble coaching," because people are just like, "I'm not you, Larry. What are we doing?" You know, even though he coached for a while for the Pacers. But I think that the biggest mistake people made was because of what you said. People assumed that because he was a freak athlete, that he wasn't very smart, and he didn't Correct. know how to do anything. And Boy, were they wrong. And the reason why the brain power matters is not as much in terms of running offense. It's talent evaluation. That is clear that Dion knows good players when he sees them at a different level than a lot of other guys do because a lot of other guys are more concerned about how they can break a kid or mold a kid or turn a kid into something. He obviously has a skill, which is I got to organize my guys by I need a certain amount of grad transfers. I need a certain amount of high school guys and I need a certain amount of regular guys that are in here so we can have a blend of a locker room. Another thing that has smarts that come into play in terms of how you construct a team, a guy who's played on that many teams 
baseball, football, college, pro, knows about locker room management as much as anything, which I ultimately think is probably Dion's biggest skill over all of this. So I thought it was a funny situation. Which, by the way, is the most important skill for a head coach, especially in college. Exactly. You know, and so I thought it was kind of a funny situation. Did Ed Werder catch a hot one? Certainly. But Ed Werder probably deserved it in the general context of Dion felt like you've known me too long to think I was going to be terrible at this. And he looked him right in the face and he told him that. 100%. Hundred percent, and yeah. no, no qualms about that. And I was gonna say, um, just to underline this, like the people skills is the most impressive. Like that's yeah. that's the thing that separates. And you know, people, I think when you talk about Dion is like just a me guy, and certainly there's some element to that. Like he's sure. prime time. No kidding, no <laughs> kidding that he's he's gonna wear what he wears and be flashy and say certain things. Like right. he's still Dion Sanders. <laughs> but the ability to bring people along for the ride in this particular case, whether it's at Jackson State or now at Colorado, that's the magic. And and certainly, you know, Travis Hunter's at the top of that list of the guy who is, potentially stands to benefit the most in terms of like future first round pick, all that kind of stuff. But that, you know, and, and getting the parents to believe and kids to follow along, who, by the way, weren't born when Dion retired. Nevertheless, when Dion was in his prime, right. like that's that's the magic. And that's where I'll say I went down to Jackson State last year to homecoming because I needed to see this for myself. I was there for something else, but I went to the game. I went to the pressers, and I was just like, man, this is impressive. And not just in terms of how the football team played, not just in terms of, like, whatever the offense looked like, but just how they ran the operation. You know what I'm saying? Like It's like, oh, right, this is – a professional gig here. You know what I mean? This guy knows what he's doing. And that alone, I think, in college football, there's so many guys that act like they know what they're doing, but they're closer to sort of a, I don't know, a phony preacher than they are an actual football coach that's trying to be an educator of young men. You can tell that this guy is a dude that is a tremendous, tremendous leadership person. And that would go for pretty much any level. Honestly, the first thing I thought of when they won that football game was, I wonder how long it's going to take him to get to the NFL. Because somebody is going to look at that and say, there's just no world in which I can't take a shot on him. Let's just say he stays all five years at Colorado, and let's just say they get to one playoff. Somebody's going to give Dion a shot, and that somebody just might be in the NFC East. That would be very interesting, and um, we'll obviously see. The one thing that I do, I, I don't know. I call it a a hesitation, a reservation about Mm -hmm. what he did with Colorado is I do think there's a larger responsibility of like a university to young people. And obviously not everyone, as we talked about, I think it was last week about the NCA and the the college realignment and and all this kind of stuff. Like blowing 86 kids out is a lot of kids. And, you know, a lot of those kids went there so that they could enjoy life on campus at Colorado and also play football. And I, if those kids had to then go somewhere else to, or forced to be make a choice of, well, I'm going to stay at Colorado, but I lose my scholarship uh, and now I have to pay for it. Or I have to choose between staying here and playing football. Like that, that is the one part of this that doesn't sit great with me. Um, I also understand that that is, has nothing to do with the competitive side and, and doesn't really negate your point of like, he understands the locker room dynamics and what he needs to build a winner. And I I just, that would be the last part, I think, of the discussion that I find interesting. And I'm curious your thoughts on of the balance of the building a program that wins and respecting that these are young people that are making decisions that you're then totally changing the landscape of what their, their lives are. If I'm being honest, that comes down to the university president and AD as it does as much as the football coach for anybody. Because if Dion walks in there and says, I can't take the job unless I can build everything from scratch, well, then at that point, The university is fully capable of giving those kids scholarships. They're fully capable of saying, you can stay under your deal. We're just going to pay for it. That is within reason, and it happens on a lot of occasions, not typically en masse with 80 kids, but a lot of times you'll see that. Kids keep their scholarships. They're good kids. They're doing well. The school says, we want you. You're part of the community. That is completely within reason. It's tough to it's it's just tough for me to blame Dion for that because if Colorado was that interested in winning, mind you, they're also switching conferences now. You know, I, I feel that that's just part of the game, and it's unfortunate, and you and I both know guys that have had rough, rough goes in college careers that have sent them on various different paths, and that's too bad, but I can't put that solely on the head football coach because it's not like Dion created that system anyway. That is how we live in college football now, and as we mentioned earlier, guys like Dabo either adapt 
or, or don't survive. I think, unfortunately, the other side of the coin for being able to va- be available to make all this money potentially or be able to move at your own freedom is exactly that on the other side of the coin for the student athletes. So it's rough. I don't love it in terms of things, but it's not something it's not a wrong that couldn't be righted if they didn't want to in Boulder, by the way. That- yeah, I might be going to Boulder in two weeks. This is how big of a deal this has gotten to. I need to see this for myself, for sure. Just like prices, <laughs> Gates is going to Boulder. I'm not uh, from Nebraska, but I might go the next week. We'll see. So you know, what's what game is that? That's Colorado State, in-state rival, oh. right up the road in Fort Collins. That's a game they should definitely win. If you're looking at the talent evaluation of what CSU Rams are every month, nobody really even knows who they are. Why did you say CSU Rams like you're not exactly sure literally what they are? I I was like, well, I don't really know if they go by CSU, but I know they're the Rams and I couldn't really (laughs) remember. You know what I'm saying? There are people who I know whose people went there who are probably going to be mad at me for that. But, yeah, I I need to see this. You know what I'm saying? Not just because their unis look great. I want to see this operation with my eyeballs for sure. All right, well, uh, we look forward to you talking about it here on the show if you, if you do indeed fun. pull the trigger on that trip. Yep. Uh, Clinton Yates with us every Wednesday now for the rest of football season here on the Hoffman Show. Happy football season, everybody. Happy football. Goodbye. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.